Welcome to episode nine of the Uncharted Territory podcast. Today, we're taking a look or a skeptical look at central bank digital currencies, otherwise known as CBDCs. Now, this is a topic, Sam's just got back from holiday, probably feeling all happy and having a lovely relaxed time. <clears throat> this is a topic that I will say for me personally, gets me a little agitated. And I said to Sam before we started that my research for this one has left me feeling rather bleak. So uh, I, don't want, I don't want to start on too much of a negative uh, footing, Sam. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your holiday before we get into it? <laughs> well, it was interesting, Dan, because all our experiences shape our opinions and our views on, on all these topics. So even though you know I've been in, I've been in Morocco and traveling around, it gave me a lot of food for thought about the agendas and what's going on and the nature of this kind of global rollout. And it was fascinating on so many levels, and I'm sure touching it during our discussion on CBDCs, because they're all all these thoughts are relevant to how we think things might roll out in different places, you know, in different parts of the world, because they've got a real job on to try and roll this out. I don't want to go too deep until you sort of give us an intro of, of what you've been looking at, but it's a huge topic. It's an important one. You know, I've been speaking about it for the last couple of years. And, you know, I think as we'll, as we share more research, people get very clear. This is a roadmap that's been, you know, quite long in the making as often these roadmaps are. And really we're much more in the stage of, how are they going to try and, you know, force this through in the ways they want to? So it's a really interesting time. There is absolutely, I'm with you, Dan, you know, it's, it's, there are bleak aspects to it, but always we've got to look at as, things as they are, what we can do, yes, yes. you know, how we can relegate and, and, and just yes. as I mean, it's your line, Dan, I'm throwing it back <laughs> at you. So let's see them as they are, not worse than yes, they are yes. and, and go from there <laughs> yes. and stay curious about it. And, yes. and but we'll see there's, they've had success in rolling out there's there's been failures there are issues nothing's a done deal absolutely and you know it's all to come but it's important discussion oh it is an important discussion you raised so many important points there sam and it, it is important to look at this an open mind and nothing is a done deal well i say nothing we'll see later on that some, yeah, yeah. some things already are <laughs> um, well so some things are a done deal for some people yes is what I, it's exactly. the caveat i'd give indeed you know. it's important to have those caveats and um I've done quite a bit of research in terms of the pushback. And you said, this is how is it going to be forced through? And my first reaction to that as well was, in order to, for something to be a force, it requires some resistance. And I, you know, I just don't know if the physics, the law of physics are playing out here in terms of the level of resistance. It almost seems like it's crept upon us, almost like an overnight you know, transformation. And everyone's gone, whoa, what are we going to do? And I think by yeah. the time we finish this episode, people are going to be thinking, what can we do? Because yeah. the reality is, it's not just you and I thinking about this, many of the major institutions like the Cato Institute have just published a report saying that, um, you know, this, the, the central bank digital currencies threaten citizens, privacy's core freedoms. You know, this is a major um, American think tank that are putting out some heavy research into this. And they're not the only yep. think tank putting, putting energy into this. So the good news is people are starting to pay attention because it has kind of sprung upon us. But as we'll see when we look at the roadmap that, that, that it's been on, it's, it, it isn't the kind of overnight suddenly emerged. This has been long in the making. Mm. But as you said, it's not an inevitability. I think, I think to a degree, as we'll, get in, as we'll discuss this, the, the digitization of currency probably is a, yep. an inevitability. There's an inevitability to, to, to the tech advancements, as, yes. as we discussed before, we've touched on before, where that goes and how that people interact that with is, is not an inevitability. But we we can see a clear roadmap. But I think it's important to you know I've always given that given that a uh, viewpoint that when you understand the baseline tech, you can see there is an inevitability. A lot of of the functions are moving on to this tech because the tech again is neutral. Yes, with with the yes. right intention, the right ideas, and you know in neutral hands. But we know that it's not, and and it's the it's the possibilities um, being dictated in a top down fashion that are incredibly concerning. Yes. Rightly so. Yes, and I think it's really important that you made that point. And that's in fact that's literally what I wrote in my first note, that it's hard that this tool is a piece of technology. It's not inherently good or bad on its mm. own. Uh, but there are risks associated with its misuse, um, uh, which which I think we'll cover throughout the conversation here. I, I also tried to get a handle on what the kind of proponents are saying. You know, what what are the arguments in favor that, that are kind of being driven behind this and there's a lot of waffle that come down to like one or two things that basically yeah. are reasonable 
um, desires, but, but again, it's the means. I, I always come down to this. It's, it's okay having reasonable intent, but questionable means is, is, yeah. is where things get tricky. I mean, the amount of times I've said that in so many different content contexts around the kind of global nature of these agendas, it's like there are there, in a large number of cases there is a reasonable intent. Well, we could we could yeah. definitely dispute that. <laughs> you yeah, know, I'm sure yeah, we will actually no, Dan, this is evil. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, and you know there, there's there's truth to that as well, but it's the means by which this is all happening which I find very challenging. But uh, before we get into the into the crux of it, so I've been you you just got back from Morocco, right? And I, I I went to Morocco when I was 21, 22 years old. Yeah, I'm nearly I'm forty this year, so it was a long time ago. It was the first country I ever visited independently uh, yep. myself with with a dear friend of mine. And, you know, people are saying we should, you know, there's people actually talking about returning to a bartering type system yep. Yep. Uh, in, in reaction to these increasingly centralized digital technologies. And Morocco was, the, and Marrakesh specifically, yep. and other parts of Morocco, because I didn't, I didn't just stay in Marrakesh, I traveled around a bit. But it was the first time I truly experienced bartering, <laughs> yep. uh, both in terms of monetary bartering, in terms of the bartering for the price of the good, because it's the first time I've been anywhere where nothing had a price written on it. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've got to take an active role, yeah. exactly. Yeah, step up to the plate. Can I see a menu, please? It's just a list yeah. of things without a price. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, <laughs> that cup of tea will be anywhere between whatever you're prepared to pay, pay for it. But also the, the means of exchange, where it's the first time I've been somewhere where they'll actually they'll look at the T-shirt you're wearing and say, I'll swap you that T-shirt for yeah. this other good or, yeah i've had that experience myself dan yeah yeah that happened to me in cuba as well actually um but i'm curious you know experience that it, it, uh, is, is bartering still a, a key or, or has it become more westernized or i mean it's definitely become westernized and, and that was what's interesting because i, I was in a diff- couple, few different locations and it was a really good example of for me how the degradation of society works globally and i've seen it because i've lived in a few different countries down in my time i've lived in france um i've lived in portugal um and, you know, I've, I've traveled not widely, but I've traveled quite a bit. So, and I'm always very curious when I travel because I really want, always curious about what, what's going on in different cultures, particularly in relation to world events and the kind of, you know, mindset. And what was really interesting was that, you know, I, my draw to leave England actually in 96 was partly innately about going back more to basics, being more connected to nature, not because I was aware of the agenda at that time. That was just kind of an innate feeling that this island felt like a very kind of, matrixy you know media-led island i didn't i wasn't aware of the why dan at the time but but for me back then you know france felt more behind in a good way and then actually france i I watched france kind of catch up you know and and lose a lot of the qualities i loved about it and become more like everyone else and then i'm sort of gravitated to portugal interesting because that was further behind and i watched that sort of catch up and it's really interesting because it was what we what everyone views as sort of advancement but actually i could see the degradation and it, 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 you know, the quality of things and the kind of tradition, you know, and the real quality of produce or kind of traditional ways into this more kind of homogenized, you know, globalized, you know, very similar. So that even when I moved to France, the supermarkets were very different. You know, you couldn't get a lot of the products you would get here. And that was kind of limiting, but actually much more in tune with the seasons and where you were. And then I saw that shift. And then I saw that in Portugal, they were further behind. And then I saw that start to shift. So Morocco is even more visceral because obviously being, you know, a poorer country, you know, what I loved obviously is the real quality of produce there was incredible. You know, all the cafes, the, the, the taste of everything down, even the simplest thing, to, because it was all picked in season fresh. And there was such vibrant local commerce, you know, huge sooks, you know, produce coming in from across Africa. And that connection, to those things, meant it was incredible. And, you know, the simple pleasures and very vibrant kind of economies. And a I had to get the example down. I was in a village, you know, that if you had the same size village in France or Portugal now, it would probably be down to maybe one or two local shops and maybe one butcher, one baker. This Moroccan village of, of a small size had about 15 local shops, three butchers, three bakeries, two pharmacies. You know, it was still very vibrant at a local level. So, you know, a 15 minute village, but in the best sense of it, you know. <laughs> yes. And but what was really interesting was, when I traveled to a bit of a more built up area where a lot more kind of wealthy Moroccans are coming on holiday and it'd been built up a lot since I last went there, they had a new marina. And what was really interesting was I strolled around and looked at it 
and a lot of those that sort of new Moroccan wealth that they go and they were drawn towards you know kind of more Western style cafes you know paying four or five times on top you know what they would normally pay for a coffee or a tea and the produce was worse but it was the kind of like the design and the cup you know they've also gone from these amazing kind of you know glassware and amazing teapots you know for pay 50p and they were happily paying five pounds for a kind of starbucks style styrofoam with a logo on it you know in a bland thing because it's a kind of mind spell of that's advancement you know we're used to that and, and getting out of that so and it's a tangent, but I just saw how degradation, that kind of globalization really gets people away from what being in tune with, you know, the really core things in a society that's so rich and so good and, and draws one into this kind of more consumerist, you know, less in tune with where you are and, and what's going around. And so I'm saddened by that, but I'm always curious to just, just to see it happening, you know. Um, and the other thing I really witnessed was, you know, in the cities, obviously in Africa, everyone, you know, the smartphone, the power of the smartphone, which again, we've talked about, is not evil in itself because you can use it to, you know, to engage with really interesting conversation or you can use it to watch absolute utter crap all day, every day. And the sad thing for me was I was sat in this city, you know, one of the local cafes, and I felt like when I was last year, I could easily be sipping mint tea around some locals. Maybe they're discussing stuff. A lot of them were sat there watching their smartphones with the volume up, you know, and I just thought, you know, and watching a lot of crap, to be honest, but that to me is the beginning of the degradation and, and the and the drop of communication, the drop of values. And as I got more to the rural villages, again, that warmth came back and that kind of much more human connection, which I really, you know, yearn for that, which is why I've often gravitated to these places and, and love that experience. So it's a long answer, but you can see how it plays out. And I think what was really interesting in the in the sort of local villages in how vibrant the economy was. People would view that as a kind of, you know, struggling but actually it was fresh produce from the sea from the land from you know i mean it was just incredible and it was vibrant and obviously functioning really well fresh high turnover and so it was really you know not struggling at all it was vibrant but of course development views you know that has not developed and you know we can improve that and so for me it was great to get back in touch with that but it also makes you curious of how how do they you know run these kind of digital ideas in these countries out in places like this yeah you know what sort of job they got to and that's why i always think it won't be an even even playing field and particularly we are in the west in the eye of the storm of, of, of these agendas and we're going to see a much more rapid shift you know where we are particularly in the uk and i know people in america and in, in a lot of the countries like canada australia we are really at the forefront of this shift yeah, Sam, what you've shared there, I think, really perfectly illustrates and, in fact, sets really good, solid grounding for this conversation is the difference between decentralized localization in the way you describe yes. those markets and the vibrancy that comes with that, in contrast to centralized glo uh, and globalized. You know, yeah. they're almost at the other, other end of the scale. And what we're talking about here is central bank digital currencies, which are yep. global, centralized end yep. of that spectrum. It's, it's, yep. You could argue towards the pinnacle of that spect, uh, spectrum, particularly if it, if it if its eventual outcome is a single global currency and, you know, the, the, the single world government that, that, yep. that, that people fear. So it's important to recognize that the idea of centralizing control over our currency and our ability to uh, engage with commerce is the antithesis of what you've just described yeah. and, and that that is an anthema really to free societies it's uh you know the prospect as we mentioned at the beginning with this seemingly inert technology uh, the prospect of its misuse is 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 of grave and dramatic concern and the impact it will have both on the western developed world and the, the, the developing world and yeah. what you've also explained there is what's known in economic theory as the convergence theory so where you described how France, you know, when, when you first went there and it's accelerated this path of progress yeah. to often exceed the, the countries that it was previously lagging behind. And um, again, our definition of progress is where, yeah. where things get interesting. And I was talking Absolutely. to Nick Hudson on the Elevate podcast and he was um, rejecting the idea of left and right politics. And he, he instead described a scale of uh, of our tolerance of speed of progress and if you think about it on one side you've got conservatism how we preserve uh, and how we hold dear certain things and we've got things that, that we progress and 
and I actually quite like that paradigm of it looking at how preservation versus progress because mm -hmm. what we often see in these kind of economic development theories and these particularly this convergence theories it, it's all grounded around economic progress rather than the wider measures of progress which is, which is our human flourishing our well-being our freedoms um our culture and yeah uh, what 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 gets lost in progress is the things that we need to preserve and that's my deepest concern yeah with central bank digital currencies because this progression towards this digitized techn uh, technological advancement that that uh, and you know i mentioned that there's very difficult to find anyone who really can put a solid argument together for their advancement other than the, the technology itself the fact that we have technology we may as well use it mm. which again is an argument that's being used with almost every form of artificial intelligence right now it's a bit but but i would argue just because we can doesn't mean that we should mm. and that's a conversation around preservation again rather than progress but the proponents of central bank digital currencies seem to argue that a it will advance financial inclusion and again thinking about the developing world the fact that they have mobile phones now means that they probably have access to finance in a way that they never did previously and if I think back to my time there, which was probably, I'll have to look at the date, but 2006, 2007, I remember being in the middle of the Sahara Desert and I had a Nokia phone, one of the bricks at the time. And the Bedouins who I was spending time with in the desert were fascinated by this device. Like many of them had never seen a mobile phone before. What was bizarre to me is I had full signal in the middle of the Sahara Desert, which I didn't get at home <laughs> back in the UK. But it was such an early stage of development that they didn't even have, you know, the, it was still at the stage when they saw a mobile, some, some people in some, certain parts of the country, they saw mobile phones. It was the first time they'd engaged with them in the early 2000s. So again, the convergence now, the fact that mobile phones are now more proliferated, again, there's pros and cons. To, yeah, that's a big yeah, discussion in itself, but it would yeah. have un, 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 uh, undoubtedly enabled commerce, yeah. which again, we could bring a whole conversation around consumerism and yeah, what yeah, commerce yeah, yeah. brings, but ultimately it gives people opportunities. Um, yeah. But what we're seeing here, this idea that this central bank digital currency is going to advance financial inclusion. It's true that digital technologies yeah. will advance financial inclusion, but again, it comes back to central bank digital currencies being the only way. That's a, fa well, Dan, That's a, fallacy. You, a total fallacy. To totally. As you're, as you're talking about the word that's just, you know, like in my head, but is choice. Yeah. Because the key aspect to this is choice. Yes. And so what's really interesting is absolutely, but that's what decentralized crypto allows is that access to finance for all these people at their own decision. Yes. You know, this is the real critical difference between permissionless blockchain technology, open source permissionless, which is, you know, Bitcoin being the sort of standard of that. And then there's obviously, obviously lots of derivatives of that, but that being the kind of, you know, iteration, the key iteration of that versus what we're talking about when we talk about CBDCs is um, closed walled, you know, walled gardens, closed permissioned spaces. So it's not, you're not going in at your own choice on your own terms. And so when you're talking about this gives opportunity, well, actually it means you're enforcing a system upon people. So it's completely opposite. So there is this truth that the technology allows that inclusion, but that's what we're talking about when we talk about decentralized crypto like Bitcoin. That's exactly that. It allows that inclusion on your terms and you decide how you interact with it and, and it's permissionless. So again, they're offering the absolute antithesis, you know, diametrically opposed. And as you said, Dan, you know, the proponents of it, as always with these things, what we're getting is a mix of word salad, contradictions. I mean, just, you know, and, and things that don't make sense. But we know that that's just part of the spell. It's just confusion and, and a lack of clarity. We always look at what do we never get clarity? Because if they give clarity, then people can see. And, and it's always about clouding things and being confused. And so there's truth in there, there's lies in there, but it's so muddled that as we know, we, you know, people like myself and, you know, we look at these things in depth, Dan, and it's a real minefield for us, let alone somebody who's a, not, maybe not as aware of some genders we are, or equally is in a line of work where they don't have time to look at this other stuff. Then that does, that is a huge barrier to getting on top of what's going on and understanding, which so much of how they work is people not understanding what's going on. And so confusion is a huge part the smoke and mirrors is a huge part of the control structure, isn't it? 
Yeah, I mean, I, even quite frankly, a number of the people involved don't really know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, not, equally, uh, equally there, equally. A lot of the minions don't even know what they're part of themselves. Yeah. Yeah, well, totally. I'll, I'll, I'll give a quote from the managing director of the IMF later on as we go along, which which is which underscores this point. But again, this point around financial inclusion has become a politically charged statement. You know, uh, yeah. uh, but the reality is, if you look at the behaviours of our governments and, and the intergovernment organisations, a lot of these things are political statements that are rarely matched with action. And again, it comes back to what is the true intention. If if our yeah. governments and central authorities really cared about financial inclusion, well, they haven't had to wait uh, for a technology to emerge to make that possible. Yeah. Are, are you telling me that it was impossible to to, to create conditions for financial inclusion? It's it's. It, I'm highly sceptical of that as a motive, yeah. but I do know that it will be used to kind of yeah. the equivalent of greenwash this yeah. entire idea because we yeah. know that the, the idea of equality, equity, diversion, uh, diversity and inclusion, these have all become political terms yeah. that, that are essentially being used to accelerate the development policies that often have nothing to do with those things. Um, and the other, the latter point again is a technological factor around efficiency of payments. Yeah. And 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 again, I don't dispute that it will. No, be. that no, no, that is a real advance, and that's why I, I talk about when you understand the technology. You know, um, our way of transacting has advanced greatly in the last fifty years. I mean, incredibly. But the the settlements are still in the dark ages, and so there are huge problems in 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 settlements that have led to real inefficiencies and um, corruption. And you know, parasite entities making things very expensive. So again, I always take about this: if we could imagine for a minute there were no nefarious agendas, if it was moving our current digital finances, which most of the money is still in a digital format, moving that onto this new system with with the, with the people you know putting together with no nefarious agendas, then it is a huge advance, which absolutely um, solves a lot of issues, a lot of um, uh, kind of um, parasite third party entities taking fees they shouldn't so it is a that always always come back to this it is a great advance technologically and in terms of settlement we are in the dark ages it can take you know two three days for things that should settle instantly and this technology allows instant settlements across all asset classes this is why blockchain is going to revolutionize the stock markets equities real world assets that's why the the move towards tokenization of assets is an inevitability in my opinion when you understand the baseline tech but the issue, Dan, is really again what they want to do with it. Yes, and it's the, again, and the lack of choice and the top-down yeah. imposition of a system. It's the you know, rather than saying done. you can, yeah, rather than say here's a, here's a system we're building. Would you like to interact with it this way? There are other ways. It's like this is the way it's going to be. Yes, yes, I, I yeah, I agree. I, I think I think here's here's the difficulty because again, I, if you think about the current central banking system. And yeah, you know, we've spoken before, and maybe it'll come up in the conversation again around, you know, there's pros and cons of the fiat, the fiat system. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, just come off the back of the coronation, and I'm sure there'll be some notes printed soon with a new notable on the note. <laughs> and we have to ask ourselves: Are we really in support of this new uh, iteration of currency in its current form? You know, this. Do people really want pictures of deceased and current notables on a piece of paper yeah. that's issued by a centralized authority that can create deflation at any time and make your money worth less than it is today? Yeah. You know, so but we don't really have a choice there either. Um, you know, we, we can, of course, now with the emergence of digital assets and cryptocurrencies, there are different ways for us to trade. And yes, we can barter and exchange. Um but, but certainly the, the availability of cash and coin has enabled us to transact easily. And the argument that digital currencies will accelerate and, and people enable that for more people is, is a valid one. But to me, the potential costs that come with this, the potential risks mm -hmm. are where the concerns lie for me. And I'll maybe we can, we, we can start to speak about some of those. But it's yep. also the complete blanket uh, blanket ign ignorance of alternatives. You yep. know, it's, 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 we've been shoehorned in this, to, in this particular direction with central bank digital currencies. There are different uh, ways in which we can create financial yeah. inclusion. There are different ways we can improve the efficiency of payments, including some of the ones you've already outlined, the decentralized within the decentralized finance, and to do so whilst protecting privacy and giving people yep. choice. But what we, what we see here with the central bank digital currencies is 
real fears over the ability for governments to track and control how we spend our money, to destabilize the free markets as we know them, uh, cyber security issues, privacy issues, um, the ability for governments to block any individual transaction, make your transactions conditional, uh, impose things like carbon tax on, on your payments or only enable you to make certain purchases or certain things every single year in a specific volume. And we're already seeing this in, in the kind of implementation of things like 15 minute cities where, yep. you know, they're trialing at Oxford that you can only leave, leave the certain jurisdiction a certain number, number of times per year in your car. And people think that's yep. conspiracy, but it's, it, it's hard written in their documentation. Yep. Yeah. So and I shared with you, Dan, didn't I? I've got a client in Australia. Um, you shared to me, you know, a, a sort of screenshot from their banking app where one of the pages was a carbon tracker. Yes. Again, for the moment, it's just for your info. Yep. But literally, you know, it was that level of this is this is how much carbon you've used this month. This is the average, you know, so it's 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 always comparing you to what, you know, how you're performing against other people. And this is what you should be. You know, no, you know, just so already that you're know, building into that, that's the tiptoe towards this is how it's meant to be. And, and, and again, we'll come to it. The other reason I'm not... Um, positive if i'm honest not positive about mass resistance this because they've got so many ways of getting this in in a kind of slow trickle manner there are so many tools they've got to getting this in it's not going to be an overnight switch over from everyone saying you've lost your cash now we've got program money that the people would go hang on not having that that's not how it's going to play out and unfortunately i'm just being realistic i can see so many ways that this can come in and i think will come in yeah, well, I think we'll, we'll bring up the chart in a minute, which will we will show the kind of proliferation of the central bank digital currencies. I think I think people are in, under the guise that this is a distant reality and that it's not on our doorstep. But you, you'll see in a moment that that's far from the truth. Um, and, and this 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 is a is a critical point that we, we need to think you made there, Sam, is that not only is are there various different mechanisms that will accelerate this and make it hard to resist, but we, we also see that the depth of the proliferation means that this is already, you know, long, long on the track to, to a reality. Yeah, which is why you often get this kind of, you, you, you have the narratives are always trying to make it look like an organic live process. You know, you get these kind of um, releases from the Bank of England or the ECB saying, you know, we're having a consultation, we're thinking about the potentialities in the future. It's all, you know, it's all a show, you know, on top of what's really going, which has been an absolutely nailed down uh, roadmap going back a long way as as with a lot of the covid stuff so you know and again you don't have to dig deep as you haven't dug you know we've dug deeper than a lot of people but not that deep to find it's all there you know all, all the, the trails are there it's all there for in plain sight it's not hidden but of course it's not shown in the mainstream not telling you that the messaging they're giving you is that it's an idea potentially i mean absolute nonsense it's it's you know it's nailed on it's well on the way and, and also the, there's all the kind of placating uh, around it so i've got a quote jeremy hunt who's um in the uk suggested that a digital pound issued by the bank of england would provide a his words a trustworthy and easy to use alternative to cash but at the same time the aim of the digital currency is to coexist with cash rather than replace it and that's that vocation again because yeah. a lot of people they, they know a lot of people will fear the loss of cash and, and what the cash represents. Yeah. And, it, and it's quite likely to be true in the first instance. Yeah, it will be. It will be. It, it, it will it, run side by side. So yeah. so that's what's really challenging when we, we are quite rightly sounding the alarm. But because it will be gradual, it won't be an overnight. Often we can sound the alarm and say, you won't be able to do this. You won't be able to do that. I'd argue people go, you, you, what, you, what are you on about? Yeah. It's not that different. It's, it's, a, it's a long process. But as we know, they're clever at degrading and bringing these things with extra measures. And I mean, look at the, it's so many echoes of the COVID narrative, Dan, isn't it? Look at the vaccination program was, don't worry, it's not going to be for the children. You know, it doesn't take long to a few months for that to change, you know. So this this placating and, and this short termism, they realise that people have short term, you know, they're on the kind of, on the on the wheel of life and they're busy. And as long as they placate in the short term, it means they just keep moving forward. Yeah, and this is where, you know, in our previous episode on economic cycles, we talked about the confluence of different cycles. But what we've got here yeah. really is the confluence of different agendas, because, yeah. you know, the, 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 the global drive to tackle the climate issues is directly intersecting with this type of thing. So yeah. your example yeah. there we gave of, of your friend who shared the, you know, the carbon tracking within their banking, you can quite easily see how, and again, the, there's documents already created saying that, you know, a certain number of flights are going to be limited per yep. year and 
airports to get it closed down to, to drive towards net zero. You can easily see before long how a programmable a programmable digital currency, and that's the key, yeah. where conditions can be applied. That's that's the that's the important thing to understand is because if you have a if you have a digital currency that doesn't have programmable features, it means you can't place limitations or conditions upon its use. Yeah. By, a pound is a pound or a euro is a euro. It has no other qualities to it. That's the Exactly. Point, yeah. But by virtue of being programmable, which is a quality that is associated with central bank digital, and I say quality in the sense that it's a property of. <laughs> property, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> um, of central bank digital currencies means that governments can and other issuing authorities can do the same. And the same is, the same is true of decentralized tokenized uh, currencies that the same is true and again people think that this is some distant reality but already there are localized versions digitized versions of the pound that aren't called the pound that were they are in a way there's the bristol pound and there's other examples as well which are kind of localized currencies and some of some people are hailing these as a uh, and i understand why as an alternative to a centralized currency because they're localized yeah but already What's fascinating is many of these localized currencies are coming with those conditions. Right, so, yeah. so you get incentives and rewards based upon the common good of the purchases that you're making. Yeah, yeah. And the, but there is no distinct agreement what is on the common good. So a localized currency where you're incentivized to buy locally, as in from local producers, like you described in Morocco, It'd be wonderful if we were incentivized to purchase from the local suppliers to, to break down the monopolies of major corporates. But again, I would want that to be a choice. Well, this, this, and, is, this is key, Dan, isn't it? This is key because I, as you're saying it, I think about the whole travel thing. You know, it, it, you don't necessarily need top down imposition. You need the, the mass of people, which unfortunately are still with the narrative, believing that's for the greater good and they'll be supporting it and, and you know, shaming people who don't. So that idea of, you, you know, people like me and you, we want free choice. Yeah. So, but somebody might say, well, actually, Dan, you know, it's not good to be taking that second flight. You should be paying a carbon tax. That's not the government telling you. That's, you know, the conditioned people also telling you. And they're up for it. And this is the danger, I think, rather than it just be, you know, um, you know, we rail against because we want choice and freedom. You know, the top down is just saying, you can't do that. You mustn't do that. We have to remember there's a huge way the population Yes, a lot of it's because of pure mind control and conditioning are actually behind that. So look at the COVID narrative when we're saying that's not you can't tell me what to do. Other people going, yes, they can. You need to. It's for our it's for your your own good and our good and my good. So, you know, it's much more than just them saying you can't do that. A lot of people will believe this is good because it's it's about responsible travel. to, And again, using the green issue, which is going to be huge. The carbon credit thing will be absolutely huge. And a lot of people will be pro that. Thinking this is about sustainability and uh, an improvement, and so that's why it's very clever to use that angle. Well, it is, and it's, it's entirely in you know comparison with COVID is, is so key yeah. because it's ideological yes. rather than reasonable or rational. Yeah. You know, it's it, when when we enter into an ideological, and we're all human. We, you know, I, I'm I'm ideological about freedom. You know, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, at times, you know, but I, the, but I also recognise that. Freedom comes with responsibility. That's the rationality. So yeah. the, the reality is I care deeply about the planet and I want to make my own sovereign decisions on the actions that I take. And sometimes that means I'll do things that are probably less favorable to the uh, natural environment than others. Yeah. But, but, but as someone who does take responsibility, I don't want to have impositions where they say no longer, you've had your flight quota for the year, you're, yeah. you're unable to, to travel. Um, but that's that's what's on the cards. Um, yeah. But the hard, and I think they got. Sorry, Dan. Go on. The hard reality is here, Sam. The, the plastic bag tax. This is a classic example where, unfortunately, people don't take the responsibility that comes with the freedom. So look what happened. For years, people have been. You know, the, the people talk about education being the key to responsibility, and that if we give people the right information, they will make sovereign choices um, of their own volition. They'll be able to assess the situation and make their own choices. So for years, people have been talking about the implication of plastic, you know, how it makes in the ocean, how it's yep. damaging the oceans, the rivers, and the, you know, the, the, the cost associated recycling and all these different things. Yeah, plastic bag, plastic bag, plastic bag, used like crazy. The moment they introduced a 5P tax, it's not a lot of money, the uproar, 
But look what's happened. Hard to get anyone uses plastic bags now. Yeah, yeah. And this this is the hard point. And this is this is this is also the wake up call, really, because COVID has given us that wake up call that we've got to wake up and we have to start taking personal responsibility because our political apathy, our kind of divert divergence between the centralized authorities calling the shots and the public actually being involved in their local community, involved in politics, involved in the national story, involved in the global story, has led to the situation where we've gone from that wonderful, vibrant, and I could see the market, that decentralized, oh, localized situation. Incredible. Just to, for so visceral, so alive. So visceral, now, yeah, yeah. To yeah. this highly centralized, uh, yeah. authoritative, authoritarian response and that's that's where it gets really tricky and that's where it also gets tricky in resisting central bank digital currencies because the apathy yeah. and the ideology of the greater good financial inclusion we're going to do it to save yeah. the planet yeah. all of that will wash over the hard reality of what the implications are totally that that that, that combination just you just brought there is so powerful Dan, and that's what i see you know and again i um from my travels you know i just i just got a feeling dan I'm seeing the bifurcation take place live. Mm. Okay. I'm seeing, you know, um, a flowering of people who are really curious and waking up and getting involved in incredible conversations and, and getting more back in touch with wisdom and decoding things and getting back in touch with ancient stuff and advancing hugely and, and progressing. And at the other end of the spectrum, I do see the degradation going further, mm. you know, and it, you know, it, it might be a small thing Dan, but on my flight, I was, the, I didn't see anybody else with a book. Now, I'm not trying to paint myself as I'm some intellectual. I always had my book and that's better. But it's just interesting that everybody, almost everybody, you know, and I've flown, you know, many times over the years of my lifetime, there were no discussions going on. You know, I, I used to remember being sat maybe in, a, in an aisle with two other people. I was traveling my own. You might hear an interesting discussion. Everybody has got the Bluetooth pods in. Yeah. Okay. And, and they, to me, were kind of, I've gone a tangent here, but I want to share it. It did feel like a march towards the transhumanism because a lot of them had them in all the time, whether yeah. they were using them or not. Yes. It's become an extension. And they've got these new ones. They're not like the app ones. They're like these ones that fill the whole ear. And it's like they have got this kind of device in there and they device was straight out and they're all watching. And again, when I looked around when I strolled up the plane, you know, in my, again, I'm judging it. I must admit, you know, but they're watching, you know, main crap. A lot of, a lot of, you know, just distraction stuff. I'm not saying I never watch any of that stuff, but it's just interesting how, you know, I just felt like I could. I was witnessing the the the, the, de the degradation at the yeah. level that I didn't see. I didn't experience many people on my travels through the airports who looked like they knew where they were going on their purpose. And I know I'm just I might be projecting, but it was a real sense of how lost and kind of dependent people. The feeling I got, um, and I think that that is why I'm realistic that you know we can see all this stuff. Then a lot of people are aware of it. It's really visceral, but that level of apathy and that level of dependence means that you know they create a society where most people do are not ready to make hard changes yeah. so is that what you said even the cash to change well as we know for all the work we do in the and, and on our courses and even with the programs it's about hard work and thinking and being creative and putting the effort in if you just want to continue on in in the path of least resistance you're absolutely going to go with what they serve up and part of that is because it doesn't involve personal responsibility yeah. and that's the key factor isn't it? the real sovereignty and freedom of having the choice Means responsibility, and I had a really interesting example of you know dealing with the banks down where I have a lot of clients, people I know have trouble, you know, sometimes with getting crypto out of the money out of the banks and the banks stop it for fraud. And part of that is the banks not wanting you to lose the money, but other another aspect I realized was because there are generally a load of clients of the bank that don't want personal responsibility. So my argument with the bank was, well, I want to take the money out if I get scammed, that's on me, but they're saying, well, no, there are people who take money out the cash point, then get scammed and then they say well they come back to us so it just shows that even the people who are asking for that nanny situation yeah. i'm almost saying i understand the risks of life and they're on me let me choose and let me fuck up or let me go and that's on me and then we're saying well we can't because other people do you see what i mean it's always police from the top and the bottom yeah it's like they okay. created that yeah and, and and i think that's really why it's going to be so challenging and why i don't see a mass resistance to these things in the short term at yeah. least it's like like uh, adults going to the bank with mum and dad for their pocket money. You know, please just give me as enough, you know, you know, so I don't overspend or I don't. Buy, yes, you know, it's, yes, it's like, yeah. So people are saying I can't. They they almost saying I can't trust myself and I do need that support. And they have created that system. You know, they've created that that world for people, and it's very hard for people to get out of that 
mindset and mentality. Um, and that's what we're really dealing with, which is, you know, and again, it gets into a bigger discussion of who are leaders and who are followers, you know, all that kind of stuff. But generally, once you've got so many people dependent, then absolutely they're so used to that, that, that slavery is easier at some level. Mm. You know, if they give them a comfortable enough slavery, then that is a, an easier path for a lot of people to stay on. Yeah, I mean, the program you're mentioning, you know, it is the dumbing down that creates that sort of dependencies. It's it's a dumbing down of the populace yeah. and, you know, the types of people who watch this type of show are, are very different. You know, they're, they're out there looking, exploring, following their curiosity. And I think that's something, because you know, I know what people are thinking, so what can we do? And it's like, yeah. well, we have we have to build a counterculture, quite frankly. Yeah. You know, what can we do about central bank digital currencies? It's a different story. We'll come to that in a minute because there are things being done. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in, in, through the legislature as well. Uh, we'll talk about that in the course of this episode. But in this in this instance, in this conversation, this, we have to be role models. You know, uh, I've got this massive thick book. And I, yeah, I mean, my hat, I'll just show you this. It's just, just happens to be on my side. This, this, isn't, this isn't the massive big, the big book I was talking about. My son bought this in this morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you had it taken away there. He's reading these books, but the first book I read to him was a non-fiction book because he just was fascinated by it. I, I don't think he understood it at all, but I've got this big book now. So in addition to reading Jack, uh, Zach's uh, childhood books, we're also going to read some, some chunky text because I want him to breed that habit of uh, curiosity. I, I've got no concerns there based on his behavior so far, but my point is this. I'm a father. I have to think about who am I as a father. I have yep. to think about who am I as a role model in, society, in, in my community. Uh, and we all have that opportunity to ask that question and, yeah. and determine our behaviours. And I think what people need to understand is society and culture is simply a reflection of the sum of its parts, each yeah. individual. And that's how each individual can make a difference. And Yeah. And it comes back to choice, Dan, that we have, you know, we've talked about it in terms of um, supporting decentralised, you know, Web3 tech. It's there, but yes. we need to take steps towards it and, and, and get involved and actively use it and, and learn new skills. So it's rather it's also it's all, always getting out of for us who are aware that we don't be passive yes. now a lot of people are going to be passive and they're not aware and that's a combination that there's not much you can do with you know we will we will reach some of them but i would argue the vast majority potentially in the short term not but we have that awareness yes like this conversation we can see things and see some bleak potentialities and some bleak realities even but equally we can either just just stay in that space or we can be aware of that and always we, we say dan be aware and vigilant and take action moving yes, forward indeed. And, and, and be creative because there is so much and they rely on us not doing that. And they rely on us literally going, oh, my God, it's so bleak and it's so powerful. <laughs> but that's perfect for them because, you know, they cannot control you, you know, taking your own steps and, and doing that. And, and so there absolutely are always things we can do. And we have that choice. Yes. And it's almost like when I saw that bleak potentiality my brain almost snapped into seeing a different reality because I could also see a very different path that could emerge. And that's where I get excited because I, again, as we've talked about numerous times on this show, we have to make sense of the potential realities, positive and negative, yeah. but we can't get stuck in the negative potential reality that hasn't happened yet yeah. because it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy if that's yeah. all we do. And, um, so we have which is why, which is which is why I'm excited by the bifurcation. Yes, yes, I'm witnessing, and again, I'm not, I'm not watching with pleasure, seeing, you know, the the the, the dumbing down, the degradation going further. But I am noticing, and it is interesting, and I'm just curious. But I'm also excited about what's flowering. I'm seeing incredible um, conversations pop up, and and areas of interest, and and you know, as I know, I'm having interesting conversations with interesting people much more than I did before all this. So there is both, you know, um, energies in this shift. And I think never to forget that, that yes. absolutely it's, you know, that's what this is all done for everybody is it's made it more visceral, more real. But yeah, as much as it's going, you know, dystopian and, and, and deg degradation that way, we're equally having a counter energy the other way. And I'm choosing I'm on that path. Yes. Now, I don't know where that leads and how that plays out, but that's kind of irrelevant. I'm on that path. Yes. And that is exciting. Yes. You know? Well, when we get to some of the resistance, I think we'll touch upon some of the uh, different paths that could could emerge but why don't we take a look at the um cbdc yeah. tracker just to give it, I, would, I want people to understand the extent to which this is and we've never done this on this software before so <laughs> this podcast tool before so hopefully you can see this this is uh, a website called cbdc tracker.org we'll put the link in the notes but 
What you can see here on the screen is today's central bank digital currency status, literally as of um, uh, this week, um, last updated yesterday. So across the globe here, you'll see all of these different colors represent different stages each country is at towards launching a central bank digital currency. So you can see from the key at the top, you've got cancelled in red. So over here, we've got Ecuador have cancelled the... Uh, what's it called, the De Niro Electronico. Um, you've got the green here. These are countries are in the research stage, including the UK. And when you, when you, when you go on this map, you can see the, the, the various different central bank currency research projects that are currently underway. Uh, you can see over here, uh, United States and America have got key projects. You've got Australia um, in research. But you've also got these purple um, current uh, countries, which are where they're in a proof of concept stage, mm -hmm. where they're actually trialing um, uh, ideas around um, central bank digital currencies. But, but beyond that, you've even got countries who are in pilot schemes. So over here, you've got Canada uh, with, a, with a pilot currency. You've got uh, China over here, as we know, with the, the, the digital yen in pilot. India, I'll talk about the Indian pilot in a minute because... And Dan, uh, just before you go any further, really interesting because what you've just highlighted there are the BRICS countries. Yes. Now, a lot of people get excited. And again, BRICS is an is an actual actual shift, you know, no question, you know, moving away from the dollar domin you know, um, dominating as a reserve currency, bit of a shift in the world. But a lot of people on the hopium side think that's all about freedom and, you know, they're breaking away from the evil system. Well, actually, they're the most advanced in terms of the CBDC. It's really interesting from our map there. You just went Brazil, Russia, India, China. So we're talking Absolutely. about the BRICS. They are, you know, it, it is a breakaway, but it's not a breakaway from uh, dystopian digital currencies. It's just a, it's just a shifting of a, you know, trade kind of economic situation. So I always want to make that point because sometimes people come to me and say, feel like, oh, the BRICS is a breakaway from the, you know, the new world order. And I, I don't share that opinion because of what I'm seeing. Yeah, uh, important. Yeah, really important distinction. I mean, that plays into a bigger co co conversation that we had considered bringing to the table for today, but we'll, we'll certainly bring to a future episode about the future of the dollar as the primary mm -hmm. reserve currency, because you know, the, one of the big challenges is BRICS. And this, this paints an interesting picture, whether a digital currency that represents the BRICS territories could actually be the primary challenger, because mm -hmm. people talk about how the Chinese yen is is the possible contender well perhaps there's going to be a, a centralized currency across the BRICS region in central in, in a digital form that could challenge well, yeah, even, the dollar even, i think it's the saudis are already using a uh, a bridging i can't remember what word they use for it but they've got a a crypto bridging asset that they're using and that's a kind of forerun about how i think things will play out across the world that there will be bridging assets neutral bridging assets which will be the kind of bridge between the cross-border payments between all these different CBDCs. Yes. So that's what ties into the crypto narrative. Yeah, and, and you'll see also there's the blue section, which is launched. It doesn't look like there's very many launched, but there are, in fact, 11 countries that have already fully launched a digital currency, um, including uh, Jamaica, which is over here. I, I don't know if we can, uh, if I can give the map the scale. Look. Yeah, Jamaica, the Jamaican uh, DEX, which has already been launched. Um, but some of these smaller countries... The Bahamas have already launched. Yeah, it's interesting that these little islands are quite yeah. advanced. I, know. I was looking when my research, it's quite interesting that they're, these little island states are, are quite far down the road. You wouldn't see them at the at the forefront of the technological, but you know, perhaps they've got small population they feel they can run it out and test on. And yeah, It's just interesting why well, they're ahead of the curve. It's something I think we should look at in a future episode because I haven't got into the detail of the, the specific ways in which they've been launched because it's also very possible that they are choosing to follow another path it, it could be that they're being tested by the global machine in these smaller territories where they're lower risk, where there's greater compliance, or it could actually be countries trying to get over the head of the curve and do things differently. So mm -hmm. I think I don't have the detail on that. And it's something I'd be very keen to explore. Well, I think Nigeria is an interesting example, Dan, because they, you know, they really struggled, you know, they, and they've, um, you know, again, we could, whether or not you say they failed, it's still ongoing, but they did start, you know, limiting withdrawals from cash and there's been huge pushback against it. Um, so that was the situation in Nigeria. And I know they started trying, which I think they will do, trying to incentivize the use of it, you know, make it cheaper. So, yes, absolutely cash exists in, in tandem, but economically incentivize people that you're better off spending the CBDC and you're penalized for cash. So that's one of their tools. But in Nigeria, there was a hell of a lot of pushback. Um, and it's interesting in terms of like the kind of surveys they've done, 
one of the most resistant populations to it is Cyprus. Mm. And that ties into what I talk about because Cyprus have experienced a bank bail-in. Yes. You know, they, they understand that dangerous centralization and they have a much stronger affinity towards sovereignty and cash because they've literally experienced what we talk about may happen in other countries, you know, in the next couple of years. They've lived it in 2013 where banks were shut for a week, a certain amount of money was just gone. So for them, that's very visceral. So again, it shows that they're, once they've experienced these things live, it's much more real for them and they're strongly opposed. So that's quite interesting to, to, to note. Yeah. Now, so from this this uh, image here, uh, th- you can see that there are actually 114 countries, which represents over 95% of the global GDP. That's the gross domestic product of the entire world. 95% of the entire world's GDP are currently exploring a central bank digital currency. So I think, again, for people's public perception of where, what, where these things are, okay, some are in the research stage, some are still at proof of concept, some are much further down the line in, in, in pilot schemes and even launched. Um, and the big question is, where is the public conversation around this? But here's where things get very interesting. So this is May 2023. Let's take a step back uh, three years ago to May 2020 and, and look at the difference. Um, let's go right back to May 2020. This is you know, three years ago now, where only 35 countries were considering a central bank digital currency. So during the course of the pandemic, three years on, we've gone from 35 countries to over uh, to, to now 114 currencies. That's a huge acceleration um, uh, with, with, with a new high of 60 countries in an advanced stage of exploration, uh, either in development, pilot or launch. So this is a huge acceleration. And I know many other uh, uh, experts and thinkers have commented on how the pandemic has been used to usher in and accelerate a whole manner of uh, new protocols and agendas. And, and it's certainly clear that during this time, there has been a huge acceleration in the uh, rush towards central bank digital currencies. Um, and as of December 2022, now all G7, all G7 economies have now moved into a development stage of the central bank digital currencies. So that's the seven most powerful economies on earth. Um, 18 of the global 20 are now an advanced stage of central bank digital currencies. Um, uh, And seven countries within that G20 are already in pilot. So nearly every single G20 currency uh, country has made significant progress towards central bank digital currency. So it's it's not just the smaller countries that are advanced stages here. It is the global economies that are well and truly on the track. But uh, I'll let you comment, Sam, if you did but before we move on. I'd like to show that a little bit further back in the history. Yeah, well, well I think it's just, it's, it's just interesting, Dan, that, you know, Pete, you wouldn't have heard any discussion in the mainstream about this back in 2020. You know, and where, look at that, you know, Australia is already in proof of concept back in 2020. So in terms of the sort of mainstream conscious, a lot of people would argue this is something that's, you know, flowered in, you know, at the earliest, late 21, maybe 22 and around now. But we can see that actually we're in we're in proof of concept in quite a few nations back then. And, and uh, you know, I'll let you go further back and see that this has been a long term roadmap that's, um, you know, got a much longer history than people are aware of, as, as these agendas always do. Yeah. And before I do that, in 2023 this year, um, over 20 countries will take significant steps forward towards piloting a central bank digital currency. Uh, Australia, Thailand, Brazil, India, South Korea and Russia all intend to continue with their or or, or begin uh, new pilots. Uh, And the European Central Bank uh, is also likely to start a pilot this year or next. So it's it's really accelerating. Um, India. India aims for 1 million users in three months. And given the size of its country, that seems like a reasonable uh, target. The, the, the Reserve Bank of India is launching two independent central bank digital currency pilots, both retail and wholesale. We can talk about the difference later on. Um, and the pilots are live in 15 cities already with 13 major participating banks. Montenegro is about to test uh, or, or run a, a pilot or a proof of concept simulation. Um, Canada in the last few weeks has put out a consultation asking its citizens what they want in a digital uh, dollar. Um, and back the, the UK, the, the, the United Kingdom right now is in a consultation that closes on the 7th of June. And I'm sure we'll put more out on how to participate in that, that um, consultation. But 
Um, the Bank of England right now has is, is already started to hire employees um, to develop the digital currency. Um, the, the, the central bank is planning to put together a team of 30 people uh, to start working on its central bank digital currency project. Um, and the Bank of England and the Treasury has said that they're looking at introducing uh, the CBDC in the UK by 2030. And I think that's yeah, I think that's more than optimistic. I think I think it's 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 likely to happen way way ahead of that. Well, yeah, we'll discuss. We'll 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 look at the catalyst that could bring that in, and I'll discuss those. Yeah, we'll, we'll come to that. Then. But but I just want to go a bit further back so you can see. You know, this this map goes all the way back to January two thousand and fourteen, and look at the difference. You know, this is this is less than ten years ago now. There was a cancelled project in Finland, and there was a pilot. Uh, research stage project in Uruguay, uh, the E uh, peso, um, but that was it in January two thousand and fourteen, and and you can see how in in you know just how quickly this has started to emerge. Three years later, four years later, um, relatively gradual pro progress. You can see here just gradual shifts up into two thousand and nineteen. You know, map barely changing, going up to December twenty nineteen, but then boom. Go into 2020. Look how quickly things begin to change. It's uh, almost as if it's almost as if the whole world ramped up since 2020, Dan. It's almost as if things speeded up somehow, in oh, agenda wise. Uh, almost, <laughs> yeah. Like this entire this 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 crisis panic was used to accelerate. I mean, just look how quickly things moved in January, uh, in in 2021 to 2022, right through to now. You know, accelerating all the way through to to May. You know, quite literally, 95 percent of the world's major economies in some phase of development. So uh, I, I wanted to share this particularly because it's a really important resource to understand the speed at which this, this is now unfolding uh, and the acceleration of that over the last couple of years. Sam, I'll pass back to you. No, it's really useful and it, and it ties back and it's interesting there, Dan, you went back to 2014 and we touched on it in one of our episodes, ep earlier episodes. That was when the ISO 20022 new you know, standard meshing systems replaced SWIFT. That's when work began on that. And yeah. that was the kind of layup for this future blockchain iteration and you know central bank digital currency back then so it's interesting this timeline is does go right back to there um and also what came to me as you're looking at that is it would because we're in a financial reset period you know for all sorts of reasons we touched on the cycles why that's playing out this is why it's an opportunity to bring this in if we were in a kind of stable um you know currency situation across the world economic situation this wouldn't be something that'd be easy even if we had the fun you know the um, technology advance it wouldn't be an easy thing to flip into place but that's where I'm going to talk about. There's so many tools now to use this as a, you know, as a, as a catalyst to bring in a new system, because because the financial reset does need to happen at some level, and that's their kind of excuse. And, and you see so many layups. They're using so many angles, as you said, not to clearly explain, you know, why they want to bring in this central bank currency, but they're using kind of they're leveraging certain narratives. So they're they're also leveraging the crypto narrative. Yeah. So the crypto narrative yes. they never explain, and obviously we have talked about. They don't give clarity about, you know, there's a lot of misinfo and disinfo about what crypto really is and the nature of it. They push the kind of scary aspect of it. And obviously they manipulate that by the, you know, collapsing things in the market themselves. And they're giving this kind of ridiculous narrative, but, but it works to people who understand crypto saying, look, all these dangerous cryptos out there. We're going to offer you a nice, safe, secure crypto. You know, and so if you have no understanding of what crypto and, and decentralized blockchain is, you know, which, which the vast majority of the world don't do not and have no idea. You always remember there's 97% of the world's population are not involved in crypto at all. So understandably, it's just this thing they see the mainstream news about and they're terrified of. You know, all they know is that that's a thing and that's, you know, that's a technological advance. But thank God the governments are coming up with a, a good one that's have all the problems and all the fear and all the danger of losing money. So they're using, they're leveraging all these, all these angles, Dan, aren't they? Um, not based on truth, but as we know, they don't need to use truth when they're leveraging things. They're just using emotion and, and, and psychological programming. And the other big aspect is, I always want to say this, that one of the great advantages of, of blockchain technology, uh, whether it's in the decentralized form or in their centralized form, is the security aspect because it's distributed ledger technology. So one of the big things, and it's been a, sort of my thesis of how they may try and bring this in via the problem reaction solution kind of paradigm is the cyber attack agenda. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that pre-echoed with talk of cyber polygon. I know we had event 201 pre-echoing COVID, but we've also had cyber polygon talked a lot by the, by the World Economic Forum about the threat to internet security, you know, cyber attacks, 
potentially blamed on, you know, Russian dissidents and the bogeyman. But of course, it wouldn't take much, whether it's a real one or a false flag one, to really cause havoc in the banking, in the legacy financial system. That's right. Because in the old system, without getting too technical, you know, everybody is still having data on their own servers. So everyone's got their own ledger and they're updating them between each other. Once you've got distributed ledger technology, which is what blockchain is, whether it's decentralized or centralized, it means you haven't got a point of failure. So you can happily take out a bank server and the records remain intact because it, it's updated across all servers across the world. So it is a much more secure system. So imagine just one scenario. It wouldn't take much to have a cyber attack that maybe takes down a few legacy banks and their ledgers and causing chaos, havoc, panic, and literally a, a real genuine loss of who owes who what, you know, what needs to be, you know, um, attributed where. So a kind of, you know, a, a genuine problem, whether it's caused by a, a false flag one or a real one, the answer to that is distributed ledger technology. It does solve that issue. So again, they've, that's another really powerful way to go, hang on, we have the technology that means this can't happen again. This confusion, this panic, this... So I think it's really important for people to understand that technological advance, you know, is is a positive one in terms of um, security of records and 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 ledgers, and and that is a potential way if they don't feel they can push it through that they may could get things more dramatic and have a reason. Look, we've got the solution because as you know, Dan, it's always the way they want to scare people into a problem, and then people are begging for the answer. Mm. You know, and I think that's that also ties into, you know, even though it's not necessarily true because a CBDC will still be a fiat currency backed by nothing. They could argue that should we get banks failing about failing, that actually this somehow, and I, I see the messaging coming out about this, they are suggesting that this is a, a secure currency that can't fail. Even though they're not going into details that actually it's built on the same sort of, you know, um, money printing system, even though it's digital. So those kind of emotions they might play on, which is if we get banking collapses, we get cyber attacks, we've got a more secure answer that that, that saves people from this this problem and this risk of losing money or, or or risk of banks going down. So that's why this financial reset period is so rich for them to bring in, you know, this this other solution and use lots of other excuses to bring it in maybe quicker and get people to more readily accept it. And I think that's really important to consider. It's not literally that they're going to be going along. Everyone's happy with what we've got. And they say, hang on, we want to take your cash and replace it with a social credit score where you can't spend, you know, this on this. Nobody would go for that. That's why it won't play out like that. And I think the other factor is that the huge way, and I'm seeing, you know, universal basic income schemes pop up all over the world, Dan. Mm -hmm. You know, and I remember seeing the posters on, you know, on Brighton Station in early days when I was back here in the UK. In 2020, UBI was was being was being put in the consciousness. If you've economically squeezed people over a few years, then what's an incredible way to get this technology out is through the handouts, the stimulus. Because as much as you want to resist something, if you're really in need economically for your, your basic needs, and of course, you're being given free money. Now, even if it has no caveats at the time, but free money, even with some caveats, for a lot of people would be very attractive. And I'll give this example, Dan, if I said to you, I've got, you know, I've got a lovely restaurant near where you live, and I'm going to give a free lunch voucher to you, but you've got, you've got to come between 12 and 1. Well, it's still a free lunch. Yes, there's some caveat on it, but it's a free lunch. You didn't have it before. So it's still a benefit for you, mm. even with a caveat. Whereas if it was something you were normally doing already, and I suddenly said, well, you can't do that, and you, but you, and you can only come from a restaurant, you come to us one, you might think, oh, I'll go to another restaurant. So I just think that's a very powerful way of getting this into the system. And the other point is, once you've got some level of central bank digital currency in the system, because I think it will be concurrent with all other systems, it then bleeds into the economy. And, to, and then you've got a real challenge. Because imagine you've, you've given a, a certain sector of the population a stimulus check in cbdc a handout well then they want to spend it at commerces so a commerce is doing business thinks well i if i need to accept that otherwise i'm missing out on on money so the economic power of just of just the economic realities of day to day is what i think will make it you know they'll have so many ways to get this into the system it won't doesn't need to be a mass rollout or a sudden rollout there is there are so many ways and tools they've got to bring this in and again i think that the fact that it may come through stimulus, through a reaction to some real problems that cause cause um, you know fear and uncertainty for people, as we always know, I always said in my financial reset talks, they're not going to bankrupt everybody and starve them. They're going to save you. They save you into the new system. That's how they do business. 
So people, the majority of people will consent to it. So I just hope that gives a bit of an overview of some of the tools and some of the ways this could come in rather than it being a kind of, you know, sudden rollout that people are going, hang on, what's this about? There's, there's, there are a lot of ways for this to come in. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, what we've seen there from the, 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 the tracker is that a lot of them are at advanced stage. Um, and I mentioned earlier in the conversation that even the managing director of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, is warning that the world is heading towards this widespread adoption of CBDCs without properly, con this is generally what she said, Kristalina uh, Georgieva, without properly uh, considering the risk factors involved. Um, she makes the distinction about wholesale DB CBDCs and retail wholesale is the, um, is the system that's used for interbank settlements, uh, institutional finance and other market activities, whereas retail, retail central bank digital currencies are the currencies used by the general population. And I think there's, there's a lower volume of concern around wholesale central yep. bank digital currencies because there's less space for undesirable surprises. And of course, you know, the ones that control the system don't want any programmable conditions on their activity. <laughs> That's, of course, for the people, a bit like, you know, all, all of these things with the 15 minute cities. It's a, it's a war on car drivers in a way, but the car manufacturers, you know, don't worry about them. They're the, yeah. ones, make, they're the ones making the things. Um, but this, the retail central bank digital currencies could completely transform the uh, financial system in, in ways that we can't even predict, even, even with some of the consequences that we're able to, to outline. Now, in addition to these kind of national central bank digital currencies, we're also seeing centralized currencies at a, a, a um, international level and, and, and a global level. So the IMF, despite those warnings and concerns, have now launched something called the Universal Monetary Unit. Now, I haven't done a full deep dive on this one yet, but it's been called the Unicoin, the Unicoin, yeah. not Unicorn, the Unicoin. Uh, as an international central bank digital currency. So a centralized digital currency that is beyond the state level designed to work in conjunction with national currencies. Now, this should set off alarm bells for all of us because the widespread adoption of a new uh, global currency uh, would be a giant step forward for many of these agendas. Um, but again, it's, it's still early stages. The IMF didn't create this as a currency, uh, but it has been unveiled. And we'll be able to perhaps talk more about this in a, in a future episode because I haven't got to uh, grips with the full depths of what this means yet. Um, but it will function like a central bank digital currency uh, to enforce banking regulations and to protect the financial integrity of the international banking system. So again, it's it's paving the way for these. Well, it's like all all the jigsaw places we can just see them. They're all there on the table, aren't they, Dan? Yeah. So they're all in place. How they're all going to fit together is is yet to be seen. But what's, we can really look across it, whether we look at Fed now, we look at ISO 20022, we look at the Unicoin there, they're all there. So the pieces are ready to be put together. And again, that's where they will obfuscate and say, well, we don't know. Well, they, they know what they want to do is my argument. You know, how they've got to find out how they can how they can maneuver and, and how they can get it in. But the, yeah, absolutely right. The building blocks are all in place. Yeah. Now, the good news, there is some resistance. So we said there may be a little, only a little bit of resistance at this stage. And people are never to be by this point in the conversation saying, my goodness, Dan, Sam, what are we going to do about it? Um, and, and the good news is, whilst there are things in motion, those jigsaw pieces haven't been assembled yet. So whilst the table may be set, dinner has not been served yet. So I think it's important to recognize that with all of these things, with greater awareness, and on that awareness point, please hit the share button. Go post this link to this discussion to your favorite Telegram channels, your favorite YouTube, uh, Facebook groups. It's important that people understand what we're talking about here, and hopefully the nuance of the conversation will, will give you a fuller understanding of what we're talking about. So public awareness is the first thing. Mm, yeah. But but the good news is there are, and particularly in America, America's really taken the lead here. I've got four things that I'll share with you, Sam. I'll just run, I'll run through these. So there's a U.S., Central Bank Digital Currency Anti-Surveillance Act going through um, the uh, American lawmaking uh, system. So it's been led by the Republican House Majority Whip, Tom Emmer. Um, it's gaining significant traction amongst lawmakers and politicians alike, including both sides of the political divide. And, and it's it, apparently it has a lot of support among Democrats as well as Republicans. It's just the Democrat, Democrats won't put, you know, due to the 
ridiculousness of political polarization, a Democrat won't raise their hand in support of something that's put forward by a Republican. But I understand that there is a cross-party support for this act, which is designed to prevent some of the um, implications that we touched on, uh, which would, would, would erode our privacy and um, result in some of these conditional aspects. So that's, that's gaining traction and support. Uh, it, was, it was introduced in February. It would pro prohibit the Federal Reserve from issuing a retail central bank directly to Americans or using the technology to shape monetary policy. So that's already, uh, already underway. And I'm sure we'll talk more about that in the future. But yep. I've got that as the headline. Um, in March, uh, the Florida governor, Ron DeSantis, introduced a proposal to ban central bank currency use in the state of Florida, arguing that total monetary control by the federal government is dangerous for American society. Many would argue it's unconstitutional um, yep. for, for the central bank, uh, the Fed, to, to operate in that way. Uh, but of course, immediately the White House uh, released an, an economic report in which it argued in favor of central bank digital currencies as a mechanism for advancing all the things that I think actually seeks to erode, which is human rights, democratic values and privacy. Um, again, they, they, they could do that. They could do that if, if they manifested in the way which people like you and I would want them to, to manifest. Um, but again, so there's, there's individual states tackling this as well yep. as uh, fed, you know, federal level. North Carolina has unanimously passed a bill uh, which prohibits the use of central bank digital currencies for payments to the state or any participation in the state res, uh, federal reserve. Um, this bill is now moving beyond um, the um, North Carolina House of Representatives to the Senate uh, and is also expected to be approved. So we're seeing these individual states as well as uh, the federal level in the US uh, taking a stand. I think it's important now we start to think about this in the various countries that um, these are beginning to accelerate. But the last example I'll share is with Texas. And it's interesting, obviously, Florida and Texas have been, and North Carolina in many ways, have, have been resistant to mm. COVID policies. Texas are taking the bull by the horns, quite literally, and uh, creating their own gold-backed uh, digital currency. So again, they're not rejecting the idea of digital currencies altogether, but they're taking a different route, a different route to take the uh, direction of those currencies into their own hands, creating a gold-backed digital currency um, and silver-backed, um, which would offer currency competition with the, Fed, the Federal Reserve. So effectively, Texas is taking sovereignty over its own currency in a way and could undermine the Fed's monopoly on money, which again is a fascinating yep, development. Development, because what that, that what that goes back to in a way in a digital form is almost where this conversation started is the local economies being thriving local economies that take their own commerce into their own hands. So it's still making use of the technology and some of the advantages like uh, the efficiencies, but it's taking it as a sound money back competitor to this centralized. So it's a decentralized localized currency rather than a centralized globalized uh, yep. manifestation so it's really fascinating development and again i know some people would still be resistant to that because they see it as a divergent from what we already have but it's it, it's really interesting to look, look into because it's a, a very different use case and it potentially offers some of the advantages that we've already touched upon uh, and mitigates against those uh, disadvantages particularly as well if the uh, anti-surveillance state act is passed uh, and various other legislation that's emerging so I think this should offer real hope to people. Um, and they always say that, you know, when America sneezes, the rest of the world catches a cold. In this case, um, we're seeing really positive legal action and, and independent action being taken in America. And hopefully we can take that as inspiration in other parts of the world. But it, yeah, I think it, uh, sorry, then, go, 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 it begins go. with public awareness. That's, that's yep. still the first step we need to. Yep. As you said in this interview, in this discussion, the media aren't talking about it. And, the, and of yep. course, the, the, the legacy media, the mainstream media, they're going to jump on the bandwagon of their funders who all seek to gain from this transition of the financial reset. So we're not going to see the resistance emerging from the mainstream media. So it's, no. it's, it's important that conversations like these begin to get shared widely, but also the message of hope that it's not an inevitability because even if the technology itself is an inevitability, the things that people are afraid of, uh, including myself, around the potential realities of the erosion of privacy, the, the centralized control, 
the conditional or programmable elements of, of, the, of the currencies and more are things that are preventable yep. in, in law. Uh, and, and I think that's the key. So rather than seeking to simply resist central bank digital currencies full stop, which is what many are beginning to do, given that the likely trajectory, as you've seen, is, 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 is likely that they will emerge, our best bet is to, is, is, is to, is to work towards uh, the best possible manifestation of those currencies and, and eliminate those risks that we've touched upon. That's, that's my view. And I know some people will strongly disagree with that, saying we're opening up the door to the devil and you, know, you might be right. That's, that's a risk that we take. Um, but, but, but by saying that, we also place all of the power in the institutions that supposedly run our lives rather than the power in our own hands. And I like to believe that we do have the power. We do have the ability to influence policy uh, and we do have the ability to create change. It's just yep. if we sit back and worrying about what's going to happen and not actually acting, then well, the worst case scenario may emerge. So yeah. my, my message is simple. <laughs> We've got to learn I, 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 and, and take action. <laughs> yeah, totally, Dan. And, and it's almost like there's a there's a dance that goes on. You know, I've, I've mentioned it in, in episodes before that, you know, we don't know how it's going to play out. Should it get more dystopian, as happened in a, in a COVID sense in, in 2020, what did that do that that gave a burgeoning for other other things? You know, I always give the example, you know, I got banned from meeting up and had the best meetups I've ever had in my life in that year. So if things got really dystopian, you, know, the country, you would get more energy against it and you get more creation. Yes. And again, I think the point is, but that creation is about effort and work and solutions. And, and that's really exciting. It's not going to be just laid on for you. You know, so that's where you have to move towards it. So that's why I don't have the fear. It's kind of like, however it plays out, I know I'm still going to be on my path to looking at other options and, and decentralizing the ways I can. So it's, it's always coming back to the old line of binaries. It's not a win or lose. No. For me. It's not an either or. It will be a shifting landscape. And I will always navigate within it, whatever. It's never a done deal. It's always moving, even, you know, even during the COVID, it's never finished. It's it's always shifting. And I think going back to your point about the states is really interesting is, but what comes to me is it's a real test in this kind of globalized world of trade and commerce of who can really stand on their own. Is it realistic? You know, I'm paying devil's advocate for Florida and Texas to say that they can cut themselves off from funding, central funding, because that's a lot of the way this control works, which is, same dependence. Hmm. If you're actually independent, you can do that. Are you actually standing on your own two feet? Can you really do that? So that's my sort of take on that. I'm, you know, I've, I've not been native. I just I ask those questions, and it's going to be interesting. And on the aspect of the kind of privacy laws, I think the other skeptical side of me knows that they use language very cleverly. Yes. Because this idea of potential privacy is can actually be protecting it from private organizations, but not the government. Yes. So yes, often there's yes. a kind of, there's a kind of, you know, yes, um, yes, a, yes, a, a yes, sleight right. of hand trick going on, which yes. go, look at this great legislation. We pushed it through. But right now we, when they talk about privacy, it's about private third parties, but, but absolutely as you just, you just said quite clearly, Dan, the government have the power to look at your digital transactions today. Yes. That's nothing new. So those powers are there. It just means it can be more afforded. And the other, the other aspect I want to bring in is, I think they will use businesses a lot to bring this in, mm. like they did with COVID, because they understand that if we look at the COVID measures, it was hard to pin fines on people. And that's because they do understand that we have human rights. And as much as they walk all over them, I think we've seen in hindsight that almost very few, I know in the UK particularly, very few COVID fines stood on people because they just didn't stand up in court. But the ones on businesses did because corporations are dead entities that don't have those same human rights. So, I remember from traveling during the COVID time down that it wasn't um, government uh, officials at borders policing it. It was the airlines. Mm. They get the corporations to do the dirty work for them because the corporations are doing it. Some of them are in bed with the state, understandably, but even at a small level, the businesses, they do feel threatened of their survival. And you, you'll experience yourself, Dan. There were businesses who were imposing things they didn't believe in, but fear for their own safety, for their own yes. survival, their own business. So I do think, and that's sort of, encoded in Christine Lagarde's language about she ends reiterated it's not going to be programmable money but she did say there will be um you know what word she use condition conditional payment services with third parties yes. right and again that's that's how I just want to show the cleverness of it I don't don't you know that the potentially that's how they bring it in more through a side door so it wasn't the government imposing certain rules on the money but it was maybe carbon credits on business that had to tax you because they had to because of carbon credits and for their line of business and 
environment, social governance. So I do think that angle will be used a lot where the businesses are, are lent, lent on. And again, so it doesn't seem like it's program of money from the top down, but it might be carbon taxes on certain products, but that's come from the business. Yes. Do you see what I mean? Yes. So it's almost a kind of, you know, a, 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 another way round, you know, another way of them saying that's not us imposing, that's just, you know, business practice in the new world for the environment. Yes, but, but it also points to this, again, the difference between wholesale and retail central bank digital currencies yep. in a way that it almost mirrors the system that we have now. So the central bank issues the currency, but of course, you and I don't go to the central bank to 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 deposit and withdraw funds. We go to the retail banks that are the institutions that manage that system. And ultimately, it's very clear that these big players aren't willing to forego any control in this or, or, or profit within this transition. So that also signposts when 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 Lagarde said that those conditions are may not be imposed centrally by the government, yep. although it's still a possibility. Yes. It's it's like the friend of yours who showed the Australian carbon credit yeah, tracking yeah. within their banking. The, yeah. the, the, bank, the banks could start to impose those things as private organisations. Totally, do sustainable, it, yeah, for sustainable yeah. reasons, for the for the greater good, exactly, yeah. for good business practice, yeah. So that, again, that opens a whole nother can of worms because when the programmable nature is determined by the individual institution, that, again, illustrates the problem of the merger of the state and corporations yeah. because... Yeah. It's, it's like all the COVID guidance that was, yeah. as you mentioned, done through the businesses. They, they didn't need yeah. law. They yeah. just needed guidance yeah. uh, of which the, the, the companies and corporations followed. And that's, that's again, where it's the slippery edge. Because totally. um, uh, you've, got, you've, got you've got the big corporations in bed with the state. And obviously, as we get more and more centralization through financial reset, again, a lot of the small people going out of business, more and more big corporations wheel on that plow, and they are in bed with them. And then you've got the small guys who are just uh, trying to survive, you know, and then, like you said, they are at the whim of fines. And, and so, yeah, it's a powerful way to, you know, implicate things and, and claim that it's not coming from the government directly. Yeah. So here we Once are in our hour and 20 end of our, uh, our deep dive uh, exploration into um, central bank digital currencies. And I was, just, I was just about to open the door to another whole topic because the, 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 other, the other element of this, going right full circle to the beginning of the conversation, is the difference between so decentralized and localized and centralized and globalized. And uh, you know, everything we've talked about over the course of the last few episodes, and if this is your first episode you've watched, this is episode nine, we've got eight preceding this. <laughs> um, I, I encourage you to go back and, and, and um, either listen from the beginning or go a la carte and, and, and tune in, because we have been also talking about the alternatives, the decentralized finance. Because through, on this podcast, we're trying to avoid binaries. We're trying to avoid the oversimplification of the topic. We're trying to look at the complexity and the holistic nature of this, this, this whole uh, financial landscape. And we've talked a lot about how decentralized finance provides the alternative to this. And that's why you know, we've created the Navigating the Digital Assets course to help people understand the good, the bad, and the ugly of the world of blockchain, digital ag- assets, and decentralized finance. Because... Within that, you can also see where the potential lies for an entirely different reality to what we've described today. But unless people open their minds and eyes to that possible uh, alternative, then we're just not going to see the groundswell of activity going into that decentralized path, which is ultimately the solution to this increase. Exactly. You need to learn about the landscape. This is a new landscape emerging. If you you can learn about the landscape, then you can decide where to go within it. And I think that's, that's so important down because people don't even know what paths exist that's what i'm often really excited about is it's showing people because as you know the sovereign journey is about finding your own path that resonates with you you know i had a call last night people said to me well what should i do i get a lot you've got to yes it can help you see the different paths and maybe some of the options because i might have done some more research in this area but your job is then to see what path resonates with you but i think what's really powerful about these conversations people don't even know what paths exist yes. or what or even what path the elites are on Yes, you know, yes. and their roadmap. Yes. At least we under, we know it. And I think that's why my point is, I'm not beholden their path. I know what they're on. I know the other paths are there. And that's when we start navigating. So understanding the landscape as a, as a kind of base layer to your education is what's crucial and help you help you move, you know, move positively from there and, and take take good steps. Absolutely. So if you're interested in getting that kind of fi- uh, foundational education, of course, we've already uh, had a lot of conversations here on the podcast They're available to you every every week. Uh, but if you're interested in going a little bit deeper, we've got the Navigating the Digital Assets course, uh, which is it's £49. 
uh, and over the course of four hours, three modules broken down into bite-sized chunks, you can get that, uh, that, that gra uh, grounding, that foundational knowledge in, in bite-sized um, chunks. So if, you, if you're interested in taking a look at that, you can go to weareelevate.org forward slash digital assets. The link will be in the um, description of this, uh, this episode. Uh, but every single week we're here, we're talking about these topics. So uh, it, it is important that, that I think during this time, each of us, and the reason we've called this the Uncharted Territory podcast is because we are, we are, we are exploring. We're, 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 we're looking at the terrain and the territory as it's changing to figure out the map to find a way forward because the future hasn't been decided yet. You know, there's a lot of motion into central bank digital currencies, but there are still things that we can do. Uh, and uh, and I think a vision just come in my mind, Dan, as you're saying that, they, you know, they build these worlds, but it's not the whole world. No. You know, there's always worlds outside it. And it's also like they build things and they want people just to walk into it. And if you're unaware of what's going on, a lot of people, you know, sadly will. And, and again, that might be their karmic choice, what they need to do. That's, that's another huge topic. But <laughs> the point is so much else exists. And I think, you know, particularly by traveling, you see again that, that gets you out of your own echo chamber of where we are today. There's, there are so many different things going on everywhere and that we have got choice, but we need to get creative and move towards it. And I think, I think from being immersed in research, it can almost create a box that feels all encompassing. Well, actually, no, they're building. I know it's a good example, Dan, that they, you know, they want dependence. They want to build boxes that you go and walk into. Mm. So it's a good example that if they can get people dependent enough on junk food and, and, you know, and an internet connection and, you know, distraction, you wouldn't need to ramp people to FEMA camps. You could pull the plug and everything, and everybody, most people would walk to the place that's got the fast food, the internet, whatever. They'd go themselves. They wouldn't need yes. to round them up. So that's kind of how they work a lot of things is they, you know, they want to psychologically corral you into moving into their box, you know, by your own kind of choice, even though you've been manipulated. So I always want to say we have got more choice, but we it takes more effort and vigilance, and, and this is the warrior's path, and it's a pioneering path. And we're all of us having these discussions, because you're on Shad we are pioneers. Everybody who comes on our, you know, on our Navigate the Financial Reset calls, we're all pioneers, aren't we, Dan? Yeah, and, and that's, I don't try and get fixed on any destination because we don't know where we, how it's going to play out. But I'm excited about being a pioneer, you know, however it plays out. And I think that's, that's the baseline for me and for other people who are curious to go on the journey. And, and I think we're at the beginning of great shifts, even if, even if a lot of other things is going maybe degrading further. Well, I can't stop that happening. I can do my best and try and sound the alarm and, and speak to people who are curious. But I think it's important not to feel like our path depends on where they all go. That's people need to go down that road. That's I'm going to let them go. Absolutely. I'm, I know where I, I want to, I want to create, you know, future paths that are more creative and more in tune with me and the people I resonate with. And that's what I'm excited about. Absolutely. And yeah. I love that pioneer analogy, trail, trailblazers, explorers, you know, they don't necessarily know what they're going to encounter along the way, but they, huh. they have a firm belief and faith in a promised land, you know, yeah. some, some some uh, brighter land and i think totally. all of us are looking we, for that brighter land we, we we don't want the hopium you know <laughs> we've got to have hope yeah um but, but but it's the it's the relentless curiosity and optimism yeah. that leads to that courageous path into a brighter destination totally and, and however bleak the info is you're staying open to possibility you know you're, you it doesn't matter how bleak the info is or what you're seeing you're open to because they do exist no question you know Absolutely. So I, I actually think there's exciting times ahead. I really do. I think in, in times like these, perhaps things will get worse before they better. I think it's yeah. almost, almost certain economically. You know, we've talked about the economic cycles in recent, um, a recent episode. If you haven't checked that one out, please watch that one. It, we've entitled it Knowing This Changes Everything because quite frankly it does when you can yeah. see the patterns of how life um, unfolds uh, historically and how that can be a predictor of the future. Of course, nothing is certain. Things do change, but there are there are things within the human condition and the systems we operate in that kind of perpetuate the same realities over and over again. Uh, so uh, knowing that could could help us see see where things could be heading, and, and uh, as a result, make different decisions to the vast majority of people who will go with the tide or walk into the boxes they're yeah. presented with. So if you're a rebellious spirit who is uh, relentlessly independent and and you want to find your own path, then uh, Make sure you subscribe to the show and, and uh, do share this with others who you know will uh, get value from this conversation because, you know, we, we called this a skeptic's guide to 
central bank digital currencies. There's a lot of noise out there right now. But we wanted to get a little bit into the detail um, and really explore the the uh, the emergence of this this uh, rapidly accelerating topic.